What I would like to talk to you about today is about data and how at Amgen we've been trying to maximize the utilization of our data um, and how naive we are or how naive we were about how hard that would be. And that um, data is a very useful tool, but if you want data to be used by machines, um, it's a much harder uh, task. And I'm going to talk about that today in what has been about a 10 year journey um, and required an investment so far of about $100 million. But first of all, just to set the context of, of where we are and what's happening in the environment around us, we're in the midst of a, of a major transformation a major transformation due to digitization. About 10 years ago is when this really started happening and people started to have the bandwidth, the storage capacity, and the mobility of data. And those three things combined um, allowed for data to be utilized in a way that had never been done before. Um, and a lot of people call this a, a lot of different things, uh, the digitization of development and manufacturing, cyber physical systems, and cognitive computing. Um, and they're all interlinked, and I don't know if in the future this will be looked back upon as two distinctly different things. I think it'll be looked at, looked at upon a one major transformation that when we got the bandwidth and the ability to store unlimited amounts of data, that it allowed us to do things in a different way. And the way that we were translating this uh, at Amgen is how could we utilize data in a different way to help advance our, our manufacturing strategies. And the way that we translated this into our manufacturing 4.0 strategy is shown on this slide, and that is one, digitize and digitally integrate. That's easy to say, but it's very, very difficult to do. What we found is that our data was a bit of a mess. We called the same things different things. We called different things the same things, and some things we didn't call anything at all. And that is very difficult uh, even for humans to figure out. But if you try to enable a machine to uh, run algorithms or try to make sense of, of that kind of data, it just simply doesn't work. Garbage in, garbage out. And so we had to set upon a task of uh, hiring data scientists and data ontologists. Um, five years ago, I wouldn't have been able to describe to you what a data ontologist was. Um, I've now hired several of them, and they are incredibly valuable to the work that we're doing. The second part of this is uh, dematerialization, miniaturization, removing fixed structures, going to a very small footprint allows for a much lower capital investment, much more agility in terms of your manufacturing footprint, and I'll show you some examples of that. Predictive technologies and AI, again, as to the first one, the first thing that you have to do is you have to have data that's understandable, um, that, that a machine can understand. And once you have that, you can start to build models, and those models can then build upon themselves. And before too long, you can start to find trends and actual machine learning, where now if a machine can understand your processes, then it can start to optimize it. Um, but it can't start to optimize it until it actually understands uh, what it is that you're doing. And finally, all of this has required a very large cultural shift um, for us. Uh, cultural shift in that uh, people have to want to use the tools, people have to want to learn to code in Python, people have to want to uh, analyze their data with deep analytics and not resort back to uh, traditional ways. Operators have to be trained to enter the data in the correct way. If the operator continues to put the pH in the comment section of your batch record, you'll never find that piece of data. Uh, so it's been a training from the manufacturing floor all the way through to the development staff of how do we handle data, how do we call things, uh, what are the rules around that, and how do we store the data so machines can utilize it. Big data is big and getting bigger. Um, the estimate is that 80% of the data that exists today was created in the last two years. I'll just say that again. 80% of the data that exists today was created in the last two years. Amazon, which is almost a trillion dollar company, just reported their second quarter earnings last week. They reported earnings of $52 billion in a quarter. 
That's up from $37 billion last year. And roughly half of that $52 billion was generated by cloud computing solutions. So a $26 billion business that wasn't possible two years ago. They didn't have the infrastructure, they couldn't do it. So giant businesses are being created on handling data and being able to utilize data in ways that were never possible before. The estimate is that that's going to go up dramatically. Um, and you see the figure at the bottom of the slide that says up to 1.7 megabytes of, uh, of information per second per person. Um, now granted, a lot of that will be pictures of cats on Facebook, which isn't necessarily useful, but, um, but a lot of it is actually very complex data. And there's one um, figure shown here utilizing some of the Unchained technology in our labs. Uh, we have a set of robots that create about 200 thousand data points per day um, on any given day. So we're creating huge amounts of data. We're starting to create that data in organized ways that can be understood. And that's allowing us to do things that we've never been able to do before. And so our manufacturing uh, plants, both our clinical manufacturing as well as our commercial manufacturing plants, create a large amount of data. For example, you know, for any given single run, there's about 500 distinct quality control pieces of data about 2,000 batch record entries that are made on a batch record, and about 500 million pieces of data that are coming out of PAT and real-time sensors. And so that's a huge amount of data coming out of a, of a single manufacturing run. And if you could capture that in a way that's organized and understood, then you could start trending that and it could tell you about how your manufacturing processes are, are running. To add to this complexity, um, our input and our way of working is increasingly complex. So if we had one single modality or one single type of molecule that we were making, so let's say we were making you know, IgG1 monoclonal antibodies and that's all we were making, all of those molecules would have very similar attributes or very similar properties that we would measure utilizing very similar tests um, and that would make our data more homogeneous. Unfortunately, we don't control the input of the work that we do. The, the input is coming from all different components at Amgen and as a result, we have lots of different types of modalities. Uh, we have fusion proteins, we have peptibodies, we have cellular therapies, we have oncolytic viruses like Mligic, we have synthetic unnatural peptides like Parsibiv and on and on, including vaccines and listeria. And so that creates another set of complexity, which is not all the data is homogeneous, not all the data is the same, not all the assays are, are close to the same. They're all very different. And so you have to decide on rules of what we're going to call things, how we're going to name simple things is how are you going to name a protein fragment? How are you going to name uh, a, a peak or a, a something that you've isolated. Before, lots of those things would either be called high molecular weight or basic peak or acidic peak or pre-peak or uh, uh, things like that. That's not very helpful when you're trying to utilize that data uh, to trend it. So we have to come up with rules about how we're going to call things. The other complexity is that we're building very different factories um, right now than when we traditionally have. Most of our factories right now look like just open ballrooms that are very small. They're about 20% of what you would call a traditional biomanufacturing facility as shown in the picture. And in fact, there's not much in them at all. Uh, we utilize all disposable systems. And because we have all of that flexibility in disposables, um, that creates a huge data set uh, related to all of those materials that have to be captured and recorded. So you can see in the figure that roughly the number of entries per unit operation in our new flexible factories uh, is double that of what we would have, say, in our what we would call a traditional factory, which is represented by our Rhode Island plant just right down the road from here. So we have an increasingly heterogeneous set of data that is being generated um, in, in smaller, more flexible factories. Uh, that's the problem statement, but what can we, what can we do with that? So again, the challenge is we have all this heterogeneous data. We're trying to put it all together in a way that makes sense. And then once we have it in a way that makes sense, we would like to have machines and AI comb through that data to tell us about how our processes um, are working. 
Um, and the, ultimately, we want to get to actionable data analytics. So beyond just getting the data in one place, we would like those to be automatically fed into models and those models to tell us things about our processes so that we can then um, act. Um, ultimately, we would like to more insights into our products as we're making them. Um, and as John has alluded to biosimilars, those are some of the most complex things that we're doing because we're trying to mimic what somebody else's cell line made 10 or 15 years ago um, in today's uh, manufacturing area. So learning as much as we can about those has become increasingly important. And ultimately, we would like to get to differentiated processes and products so that the, pro the products that we're making are different from what's out in the marketplace. So how do we do that? So what we put together is this global network. Uh, it's across uh, the entire globe. It's located in all of our manufacturing sites. We have process monitoring sensors and uh, PAT in all of these uh, facilities. And they all feed back to a centralized location um, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and this has, again, required a significant investment of about $100 million over the last several years. Um, and, and ultimately, the, the place, the reservoir, or where all of this goes to is a, is a, it's a hybrid solution, but most of the data is in the cloud. Um, it's allowed us to put massive amounts of data into a single place where we don't have to continue to buy more servers. Um, and, and all of our data capabilities um, are, are, are linked into the data lake. So all the lake goes into the, all the data goes into the lake, and then linked to that are our LIM systems, our electronic lab notebooks, um, all of the SAP bill of materials and all of that information about the origin of raw materials and how they were uh, acquired and what batch, et cetera, is all uh, accessible via um, SAP, our document systems, our SOPs, and, and all the raw material data. All of that is, sits um, by the lake and inside of there are all the analytical tools that you can utilize. So we've embedded data analytics and reporting tools um, into this uh, system. And so, so if you're going to do a set of data and the output of that data is going to go into a model that we've uh, generated to, say, predict uh, CEX chromatography output, instead of having the scientists have the data and then have to walk it over to the model and put it in the model, uh, the protocol now automatically sets up the model and the model dictates what the action set would be so that you don't miss a data point. Because lots of times we want to take a set of data and put it into a model and we find out out that we didn't quite get that sieving data at this time point, so we're going to have to interpolate it. So, but but now instead of that, the model actually dictates the the testing plan, so that all the all the data is set up inside of that testing plan. And then in terms of uh, changing the culture and the ways of working, we've moved to what we call um, data access by default. And so what I mean by that is. It used to be that uh, if you wanted some set of data or you wanted to know how a unit operation was performing, you would ask somebody, hey, could you go get the last several manufacturing runs from that product and, and do some analysis and tell me what the PPK is for that particular unit operation? And that would take you know, a week, two weeks of somebody getting the data to come back eventually and say, you know, here's the, the PPK for that unit operation. Instead, we've moved to data access by default which means all the data is available to everybody all the time. And so at any given time, at any given moment, um, if you're so trained, you can go to our NOC center, the Network Optimization Center, and get the PPK for almost any of our unit operations and any of our manufacturing facilities around the world. And this is what it looks like. So in that upper left-hand picture is a picture of uh, scientists looking over a set of data coming out of our Singapore facility. Not only is that real-time data, so that's real data of uh, dissolved oxygen and glucose coming out of a bioreactor that's in Singapore, but on top of that is the real-time uh, multivariate statistical modeling is built into that. So they're not just looking at raw data, they're looking at a trending of the data over the last several runs, and they're also looking at the PPK related to that operation, and they can see if it's running out of trend, instead of waiting for that to turn into an NC that we then have to go investigate, they can intervene uh, in real time uh, and avoid that and actually uh, make a correction on the fly. And so it's a little bit small on the left-hand side, and so I'll have to read it to you because it says 87% 80, of our parameters that we measure are operating at six sigma or above. 
that gives us a reliability that we've never had before. So we have Six Sigma performance of, of most of our manufacturing processes. Um, we've been able to reduce the FTE required to close out NCs because we're predicting and preventing waiting to, rather than waiting to break uh, and, and then fix. And that gives us a much greater efficiency of how uh, we ultimately operate. And ultimately, uh, that relies speed. And as you know, speed and cycle time allows you to reduce inventory levels. We always keep these very large inventory levels because our ability to make product related to market demand is so slow that the only way that we can do that is by keeping the inventory. By increasing speed, it allows us to reduce our inventory on hand, which uh, has been in excess of $3 billion of inventory on hand at any given time for Amgen, and we've been able to reduce that significantly. So ultimately, the data has allowed us to have humans um, look at the data and take action. The, the next step in what we're trying to do now, um, and I would say that we're just starting um, to see some evidence that we're getting uh, value out of that now, is we would like to have the, uh, the machines actually learn our processes and then tell us um, how things are performing and what we could uh, do. And um, that works, it, it works okay. So far, uh, what the machines have told us are things that we already know, uh, that raw material variability results in NCs, that leaks cost us a lot of money, um, and that downtime is the biggest cost in all of our factories. So we kind of knew all of that stuff already. Um, but uh, it has told us a few things that we didn't know, which is that it has told us that well, there are certain parameters of raw materials that are costing us money and causing downtime that we didn't know about, that we had not identified, that, that trending over 50 or so batches, uh, the machine was able to pick out those data, whereas no human, at least up to date, had ever been able to point that out. And so uh, an example of this is, you know, we have these 15K processes uh, over 56 batches. That, that's about 50 million data points. That goes into the, in, into the algorithm and the machines look over the algorithm uh, and ultimately trend and tell us information about how our processes work. And so, for example, um, you know, the, the, a model that we utilized to predict yield uh, pointed out a, a raw material defect that was not known previously uh, to impact performance. And, you know, these are people that have been, you know, making Imbril for a very long time. And to have somebody tell them, actually, the reason that you're seeing variability is because of the incoming raw material there. And to have them adamantly tell you, you know, I've been making this product a long time, there's no way that's the case. Uh, but to demonstrate that to them through data and, and show a process improvement has been quite powerful. And so these models that we that that we develop, but actually the machine are developing these models now, um, are better than anything that we've ever been able to do uh, before. And uh, we've developed a computational fluid uh, uh, digital twin uh, that allows us to model how uh, shear forces and other things are going to happen inside of the bioreactor, and this allows us to. Um, get rid of wet chemistry and replace that with in silico models so that in our most recent um, filing with the FDA, in fact, we replaced many of the, the standard process characterization data that would be uh, characterized by a lot of wet experiments with in silico um, data, and that was accepted by uh, the FDA. The rest of the world is still has some room there, but, but the FDA seemed very progressive in that regard. And so this introduces the concept of agent-based modeling, um, which now, if the machine can understand the system and can set up models, then instead of doing a standard Monte Carlo simulation where you basically just uh, take a variable and have it just move at random, um, instead of having it just move at random so you can see the impact on the whole system, you can have it move within a given set of criteria that have been set because of your previous data. And because you have about 100 of those that are all interconnected, um, it's very difficult to, to do that yourself. But, if, but the machine, it's not difficult for the machine to do that because it knows what that parameter has been um, 
uh, relative to the other ones, and it can ultimately tell you a model about what the interdependencies are on some of these. It's still very complex, and, and we're certainly not claiming um, victory uh, by any means, but, but we are claiming that it's now overwhelmed us, that uh, it's providing way more information than we're able to, to digest, but we're trying to figure out how how to take that impact that's coming out of AI and the machine learning and make uh, better decisions. So, uh, so in conclusion, hopefully um, what I've been able to show you just a, a, a glimmer of is that um, on the front page of John's Gen Magazine in 2028, it's gonna say big data predicts uh, uh, medicines that are gonna be successful and uh, in, a, in a way that increases our productivity. That's one of the headlines that I'm hoping for, uh, John. Um, but, uh, but, the, but ultimately, big data is here. There's a lot of data around, you've probably noticed that. Um, but you have to embrace it, and that's going to require cultural change. It requires people embracing ways of doing it, learning new tricks. We have a coding boot camp, which we're teaching scientists to code in Python, um, and they love it, and they're able to, to customize their own reports in, in ways that we never would have imagined before. We have advanced predictive PAP methods that are allowing us to predict and prevent instead of waiting to break and fix, and we're developing more adaptive self-learning techniques so that the machines can actually learn our systems better. Those AR tools are starting to be used beyond just process development and manufacturing so that we're utilizing that to help manage our supply chain as well as our, our quality. Thank you.